Uh, so thanks, Paula, and welcome, everybody. Um, thanks again to our local hosts here in Montclair State University. Um, this is, as Paula mentioned, the first time we've had the meeting outside of Boulder, Colorado in a long time. And it's really exciting to be in a new environment and centered on a new geographical community. So um, my job here is just to give some quick updates from the integration facility. And for those of you who are new to CSTMS, tell you a little bit about what it is and what it's about. First of all, let me, let me vamp a little bit on this theme of dynamic interfaces that Paula mentioned. You know, our location here in northern New Jersey is in many ways a nexus. It's a place where dynamic interfaces come together. That's true in the urban and suburban and rural realms. But it's also true of the environment, the geology, the biology. So if you look, for example, at the terrain instead of the roads and the towns, I grew up here. I got used to thinking about roads and towns. It was only later I learned about the incredible geologic story that's under our feet here in northern New Jersey. And you can see some hints of that in the complex terrain. There's, for example, this interesting ring-like feature of paired ridges just to the west of us. Um, if we look at a geologic map, it confirms our suspicions that there is something interesting going on here. Here to the west of us in the highlands in western New Jersey and uh, Pennsylvania is the essentially the guts of the ancient Appalachian Mountains, formed during the Paleozoic and then torn apart again during the Mesozoic as Africa and North America parted ways to create the Atlantic Ocean. And part of that separation process was the creation of rift blocks, which slipped and dropped downward to catch a sedimentary record. One of them is where we're standing right now. It's called the Newark Basin. In this map, it's basically the sort of a green and orange blob that stretches northeast to southwest. It was happening during the Mesozoic. There's dinosaur footprints and dinosaur bones, and so you'll find these in local museums. There were outpourings of flood basalts that spread across the basin surface and got tipped on their edge. And today, the edges of those flood basalts make this peculiar uh, ring of topography that we're basically sitting on the flank of here. And in fact, if you go out to the entrance and look out the window, you see beautiful exposures of that blackish basalt that makes up the Wachung Mountains. So there's a rich geologic history here. A lot of that history, of course, is captured in the sedimentary record. So offshore on the New Jersey self, there's this incredible uh, stratigraphic record of a deep history. It, in fact, provides us one of the best records of sea level that are available, long-term sea level history. If we fast forward in time and, and go to the Pleistocene, of course we have the Ice Ages, and the most recent glaciation would have covered where we are now. Maybe the building would have poked up above. Um, but it, it helped build Long Island. It left behind a complex of moraines and, um, and glacial deposits in northern New Jersey, and it too was reflected in the offshore record. So all of that forms the template for today's landscape where we are, which has, of course, a dynamic, active hydrological system that people rely on. It has a very dynamic coastal system. That's one of these dynamic interfaces. You can see hints of that in the barrier islands of uh, Long Beach and uh, Sandy Hook and the, um, the various barrier islands in southern Long Island. And of course, today, there's a new species around that is having a big influence on these environmental systems, and that's, that's us. Right? So I mention all this just because it's a nice encapsulation of this theme of dynamic interfaces from deep time to human time, and it's a nice representation of the span of work that this community does under this broad heading of Earth surface dynamics. And of course, one of the ways in which we study these past and present systems is through computer models. And computer models, I think of them partly as high-tech lab tools that require careful, precise engineering and quality control, but they're also ideas, right? They're the containers in algorithmic form of our evolving ideas, so they need to be flexible and adaptable and keep changing as we learn more. And that's where CSDMS comes in. So CSDMS, if you pronounce it with a soft C, it sounds like systems. So sometimes people say systems. It's really three things. First of all, it's a modeling system and I'll say more about that in a moment. It is second, uh, a facility funded by the National Science Foundation, so thank you to the National Science Foundation for supporting this community. The facility works in computing, community, and education to support the work that you all do. And then third, it is, and most important, as Paula said, a community. It's all of us in this room, and it's 2,400 of our friends 
spread out across 77 countries who are all interested in the surface of the earth and interested in making our work more efficient by sharing the computational tools that we develop and use along the way. So let me say just a few quick words about what goes into this modeling system. It's not a single numerical model, as most of you know. It's uh, that the challenge of scales and domains is way too big for that. Instead, it's a collection of integrated resources that help us do our work more efficiently. One of those resources is the CSDMS model repository. So this is an online catalog of model codes written by community members and shared as open source. Currently, we're up to now 424 model codes and tools. There are search tools. You can search through the catalog. There's a, a bibliographical collection, references to these 400-odd models that's now over 20,000. So there's a lot of information there. And it's a good place to, if you have a model or a tool that you want to contribute, this is a great place to do it. That said, a collection of independent models does not by itself make a complete modeling system. Often, as Paula said, there's a need to look at what happens across interfaces. And that means coupling models, combining models in integrated workflows. And one of the ways that, one of the things you need to do that is some level of standardization, some kind of interface that allows models to be operated together as objects. And to meet that need, CSDMS develops and disseminates what's called the basic model interface. Many of you know of this. It's essentially an interface standard for numerical model codes, which is a fancy way of saying it's a list of functions that make a code act like a component, an object that you can interrogate and work with. Um, it's really, uh, in, and it could be done in any language. It's basic things like initialize the model, get it ready to go, update it by making it do its thing, interrogate its values, change its values, because you need to do that if you're coupling, and so on. So BMI has been adopted by modeling groups around the world. It's used now by the um, NOAA National Water uh, group for the, the next-gen national water model. It's used by the U.S. Geological Survey for surface and groundwater modeling. It's used by Deltaris. It's used by the eWater Cycle Project, to name a few. So the BMI is great. One thing it doesn't directly address, though, is the language gap. What happens when people write models in different programming languages? To meet that need, the approach that CSTMS has taken is to use Python as a hub language and to provide a tool called the Babelizer that will essentially wrap a code written in, say, Fortran or C with a Python front end. So it becomes a module that you can import into a Python session. And that means that you can, you can create a new integrated model that combines different component parts that may be written in different languages in a single Python script. So it's a handy way to work. Now, typically, as you all know, we don't use models in isolation. We work with data as inputs, as comparisons, as tests, as calibrations. And data can be a real headache. So to try to reduce the headache and make it scriptable as well, we've been uh, developing a collection of what are called data components. Some of you may have seen Tian Gan's new paper about data components. These are essentially little Python codes whose job it is to go fetch up data from a particular data set or a particular type of data. So we're up to now, I guess, nine data components. One of the newest ones from Chris Jenkins and Tian Gan is DB Seabed, so that's ocean floor texture. There are data components for meteorology and climate, for soils, for topography, and so on. Anybody can write a data component, so if, you are, if you're already halfway to writing one because of your work, I encourage you to go and go the rest of the way. We have now instructions on how to do it on the CSDMS webpage. So that's data components. You know, one of the um, I think one of the other things that comes up here is a need to create new models. Um, we have legacy models that can act as components, but what about when you want to write the next generation of models? To meet that need, we've developed a, a package. We've developed together, all of us, a package called LandLab. That is a Python package that is designed to make it easier and more efficient to create a new model by using component parts that others may have already written that make the process easier. One of the key things behind LandLab is the idea, and it's for 2D grid-based models, so one of the key ideas is the idea of a grid object. So you can invoke a grid in a, as little as a single line of code, whether it's a regular structured grid, a square, a hexagon, irregular, unstructured, um, and that saves you, the programmer, time to do all that from scratch. Then there's the idea of components. 
So a component is a, a semi, not quite, standalone, uh, standardized piece of Python code that does one thing well that other people might also want to do. So think about like, you know, it's a sunny day, calculating solar radiation on a terrain surface. That's a common calculation. Or maybe it's routing water across terrain. These are the kind of things that go in components. With grids and components, it means you can write an integrated model as a, as a relatively concise Python script that brings in a grid and also pulls in some components. So, okay, all these tools help us work with models together. One additional need that's come up, especially recently, is the need for reproducibility. There's been a lot of push for reproducible science, especially computational science. You should be able to recreate computational results, but that takes some work. It helps to be able to script it, but you need some additional tools. Fortunately, our colleagues in other branches of the science are also working on this, and we've recently partnered um, with a group called Wholetail that has a really nice approach and set of tools for making essentially reproducible computational packages that can be stamped with a DOI and can be um, containerized. So if you're interested in learning about that, there's some links to resources on the system's website. Let me say a little bit about hardware. CSDMS has not primarily been a, um, a hardware facility. There's plenty of HPC facilities around the country and around the world for that. But it often is useful if you have remote resources you can tap into to test things out, um, to run classes and workshops. And so to meet that need, um, we have uh, been running these Jupyter Hub servers. There are three of them, actually. There's one called jupiter.openearthscape.org. That is for logging on and trying stuff out. And I believe everybody in this room now should have a login on that, right? Um, there's lab.openearthscape.org. That's used for classes and workshops. And a bunch of those, you know, a bunch of the clinics today will be using that. And there's Frontier, which is, okay, I have a bunch of runs I have to do for a paper or for a conference presentation. That's what that's for. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, now, there's no free lunch. All these tools I'm talking about have a learning curve, and you need to cross the learning curve to be able to take advantage of them. And so we've tried to accompany the resources with learning resources of a variety of types. So there's a big set of tutorials, both for like learning bits and pieces of tech and for, um, for various kinds of lab exercises. And thank you to the many of you who have contributed notebook tutorials to this collection. You can run the tutorials through the Open Earthscape Jupyter Hubs. There's also live learning opportunities. Um, many of you know about the Earth Surface Processes Institute, for example. So that's going to run again later this summer in August in Boulder. Um, we're aware, however, that we haven't been able to meet the demand for that. So consistently, we've had three or four times as many applications for this as there are slots. And so we've tried to provide other opportunities. One of those opportunities is called the CSDMS Roadshows. So this is when uh, a couple of engineers from the CSDMS integration facility travel to one of your institutions to put on, let's say, a three-day uh, interactive workshop on scientific computing with Python and geoscientific modeling sorts of things. We don't have, so we're doing two of those a year for the next few years. We don't have a full schedule yet, so if, you, if you'd like to see one of these at your institution, um, have a talk with Mark. Mark, I saw you out there somewhere. There's Mark, he has his hand up. Um, there's also a variety of online uh, learning and communication resources. So we have a help desk. You can post a question, and one of the engineers will try to answer it. There's a CSDMS forum, which is meant to be the stack overflow for this community. So you, one poses and answers questions among the community as a whole. There's office hours, so you can sign up to consult via Zoom with one of the CSDMS engineers. There's a webinar series about one a month during the academic year. And there's a growing collection of online self-paced learning resources. And there's going to be more of those um, coming in the near future that are oriented toward learning, um, learning scientific computing by learning you know, particular topics like rainfall analysis. OK, uh, let's see. What else to say? Um, oh, yeah, the integration facility based in Boulder, Colorado, we often get visitors. Um, as some of you know, for the last couple of years, thanks to funding from NSF, we've been able to host graduate students, summer visitors. Um, 
and that's been really fun. You're going to hear from some of those folks on Thursday afternoon about their, their work. Um, but we often host other kinds of visits too, people coming on sabbatical for a couple of weeks. Um, a graduate student wants to come and, and rub shoulders with the engineering team for a little while. We encourage these visits. Um, if you're interested in paying a visit, just let us know. Uh, finally, we often partner at the integration facility with investigators on projects and proposals. We're happy to you know, work with you on developing a piece of a proposal that's a broader impacts to make your code sustainable and, and part of one of these resources like LandLab or the uh, Python modeling tool. Um, so if, you wanna, if you're interested in that, just let us know. Okay, so let's see. I want to thank um, the uh, executive committee, which is Paula and the chairs of our various working and focus groups. Can folks on the executive committee raise your hands so people who know who you are? So these are your representatives to um, the executive committee that is the main decision-making body in the integration facility. Um, I also want to thank the integration facility team who have worked really hard throughout the year to produce all these um, products and coordinate with the contributions that you all have made and to put on this meeting. I was, and I want to thank the, uh, the scientific program uh, committee. So Jackie, Catherine, Tony, Sagar, and most especially Jorge, our local host, uh, for allowing us to do the meeting here. Okay, so I'll just conclude by a, giving you kind of a sketch of the meeting over the next three days. So if you work at, we're having keynotes first part of the morning, which we'll jump into in a moment. In the second part of the morning, we'll be doing breakout sessions, and today's breakout session will be a kind of a meet and greet exercise around the theme of human dimensions here in this room. Uh, in the afternoon, we'll be doing clinics. So these are roughly two hour blocks of time when you get to sit down and learn hands on about a cool package or model or technique or whatever. You signed up for clinics. If you forgot what you signed up for, just look at the back of your, your name badge. And uh, Lynn, can you remind me, are the name, are the numbers, the rooms accurate or do they need to be changed? Yeah, so pay attention to the clinics, but not their rooms. The rooms have changed. Uh, then in the afternoon, today and tomorrow, we have poster sessions here on those poster boards. And as I mentioned on Thursday afternoon, we'll be hearing some lightning style talks from, um, from some of our summer scholars. And then we have our banquet here in this room tomorrow night. I think that's about it. Anything else I should mention? Okay, awesome.